You're watching Tough Later Maths. This video is made possible by generous support on Patreon by our viewers. Rather than sponsorships by video games, mattresses and boxes, or other stuff that you just don't want to see. Today we have a very interesting experiment involving the De Laval nozzle, also known as the Converging Diverging Nozzle, sometimes called the CD Nozzle. The brainstorm and creator of this idea is Sar Tal from Israel. Now Sar is a candy maker by trade, makes delicious candy, but he also has a very creative mind and he's very talented. For the test, he created seven of these De Laval nozzles. Now there were quite a few uh, challenges that we had to overcome to make this test possible, and I'll explain that in a few minutes. Invented in 1888 by a Swedish inventor, Gustav de Laval, these nozzles were originally designed to direct high pressure steam to drive steam turbines or turbines if you prefer. But rocket scientists including Robert Goddard utilized the de Laval principle to convert high pressure low velocity gases into a concentrated low pressure but high velocity stream of gases coming out the nozzle. But what will happen if we drive just the nozzle at a high velocity through the air. Will it create some sort of ramjet effect to actually increase the velocity? Well, pretty unlikely. That just is counter to what we know about physics. But will it enhance the stability in any way or possibly just cause it to tumble through the air? That's what we really want to find out. Now, if we try to launch these at too high of a velocity, that's not going to work because we have a shock wave forming at the nose called the bow shock and that would prevent any airflow from going through the nozzle at all. So the first challenge is to keep these at a subsonic velocity. Next we need some kind of visual indicator to let us know when we have potential airflow through the nozzle. Now this is done with a very lightweight paper plug that will just fall out. If it's flying at a supersonic speed the plug will not fall out. We'll also use some lightweight oil and some red dye, which we may be able to see with the high-speed camera. I've jabbered on long enough. Let's get out to the test range and see how these things fly. We're up 15 yards. Okay, charge up the uh, steam reservoir. Flux capacitors. Vacuum pumps on. Vacuum pump on our vacuum gun. Okay, I am ready. Holy mackerel. 891 FPS. Even though we were well below the speed of sound, Mach 1, the paper indicator plug remained inside the nozzle. Now this is a surprise to me because I thought if it's below the speed of sound, there's no way the plug is gonna remain in there. I've never seen a test like this done before, so chances are you haven't either. Hey, we uh, managed to capture that one. You can that was see our goal. In the, see in the video how far that thing flew. Yeah. And this is how I found it out there in the weeds. Get, I mean, center on there. I didn't have the, you know, I didn't give these things much chance of being accurate. Those but they, held up together all the way. Yeah. No. Uh, there's some plastic stuck There's a in the back. And bit of TP right there. Oh yeah, the little plug. <clears throat> there shouldn't have been. It should have ejected it out. But that one's <coughs> still good. Perfect. Danny is charging up the uh, trebuchet. <laughs> okay, uh, the first one was very accurate. Let's see if that continues. I'm ready. Now in this shot we've reduced the velocity a little bit and sure enough our paper plug has fallen out the back. Now we do have the potential for airflow at this point but we're not seeing any indicator visually which would be the oil that's on the nozzle that would be atomizing as it's flying through the air. Even though this isn't flying at a supersonic speed, 
it's still in that transonic range between Mach 0.72 and Mach 1. We won't have to reduce the velocity very much to bring it down to true subsonic velocities. On a positive note, at least the nozzles are stable in flight and they're relatively accurate too. Remarkably, we were able to recover six out of seven projectiles in the test. Five of them were still in perfect condition after recovery. Okay, let's see what it does to a roll of wet toilet paper. Just because, because. <laughs> so we can wring out the shore enough. Huh? Yeah. Okay, uh, adjust the pressure rupture discs, charge up the steam pressure on the steam catapult. I'm ready. <laughs> we find that one, I'll be surprised. Even though we got an error reading on the chronograph on this one, it would be safe to say that the velocity of this one is probably a bit higher than even the first one. Not only do we have the paper plug still in place, but we also have part of the gas seal component still lodged in the back of the nozzle. I believe if we had allowed the nozzle to continue traveling downrange further, allowing it to decelerate more, all those components would have eventually just fallen out the back. Good old Kevlar vest. Caught it, huh? Caught that little booger. It had the back pushed out about three inches here. Wow. But didn't think we had it to begin with. But, but this is interesting because the paper mache little paper plug there is, well, unless that's from the toilet paper. It's either the toilet paper or some of this uh, fiber out of the vest. Oh, it's definitely paper. Okay. But, um, We'll have to see on the high speed. That's three out of three. That's pretty good for capturing uh, something <laughs> like that. That was a lot of energy for something that's sub subsonic. Yeah. Not bad at all. All right. Okay, lead plate, 25 yards. That's usually shoot a lot closer than that. Okay, I'm ready. Here we go. It just stuck right in it. Here's our results. The little uh, toilet paper wad you put in there to see if there was airflow through this rode all the way to here. I saw a, a green part of the, uh, you know, the launch system, the wad. Yeah, it's thing. been it's been cutting discs out of that. Yeah, and then it uh, it kicked out the uh, little toilet paper wad when the lead tried to come back up through the hole. Okay, it's so firmly no, embedded in there. There's no airflow through that. No airflow. Okay. That's that shock it, wave in front. Well, we're still subsonic though. Well, yeah. there's there's still going to be a. a, a a little bit of a wave in front of it. Right, yeah, it's, a, weak, it's pushing air. a weak shock wave, yeah. It's pushing air. Yeah, but again, yeah. even at subsonic speeds, it's it's not, there's not a pressure to push it out. No flow. Yeah. Do you have it oiled up or whatever? It's died up. Okay. Ready Got a to new rock uh, rupture disc in our vacuum cannon. Okay, I'm ready. All right, here we go. That's the way to do it. Get the best from running away. Well, you got smart, huh? As our outside air temperature increased throughout the testing, uh, so did our velocities. We didn't compensate for that properly. We were trying to reduce the velocity as we progressed along, but uh, as you can see, that was a little difficult to control. So we're still in that kind of weird world of the transonic velocities. So we'll 
reduce the velocity even more and get it into true subsonic velocities and see what effect that has. Okay, we'll shoot a soda can. A little uh, tribute to Hickok or somebody, I don't know. It's a, a lot smaller target than what Hickok shoots at though. Yeah, well we didn't bring any pots to smoke. <laughs> Okay, we got a little red dye on this one with some oil. Maybe we'll see a vapor cloud. Maybe. Okay, I'm ready when you are. All right. <laughs> I think we went for a ride. In this test, I was expecting to see visual clues indicating when we had airflow going through the nozzle. So instead of visual clues, we had audio clues, which I didn't expect to, you know, I didn't expect these things to kind of whistle through the air like they did, uh, at kind of a high pitch. Once we were able to get out of that weird transonic range and into true subsonic speeds, that's when the magic kind of happens and we're actually getting that airflow like you would expect it to occur. I expected it to occur at a little higher velocity than this, though. Yeah, those things are pretty good about punching circles. Oh yeah, they're like wad cutters. Here's the soda can. Again, the projectile's in perfect shape. Hey, uh, we're now at 25 yards. Let's try, uh, let's see if we can see anything different at 25 yards. Okay, I'm ready. All right, here we go. That vest took off like a scared rabbit. I heard a little metallic ting. I did too, it went ding. The first whistling nozzle uh, phenomenon was not a fluke at all, and we were able to repeat the results a second time. Even though we had the paper plug falling out of the back, which would indicate a potential for airflow, we never saw uh, the visual clue of the oil or the red dye atomizing um, through the nozzle and out the back, unfortunately. But luckily, luckily, we had the audio clue of the whistling, indicating we had flowed through the nozzle. I hope that you also learned something from this video. I sure did. Thank you for your support on Patreon and channel membership.